Um, so can we help uh, to extract information from the environment in a more reliable way? And the other side of the coin is basically looking at how can we build bodies that help us to facilitate the control? Can we outsource control to the morphological structure? And also can a clever body help us to accelerate learning in this context? And I would like you to give you a few examples from both bots and also some general kind of understanding how we think in a theoretical sense about morphological computation. So let me start with that. We also develop some theoretical models that tell us also more about what kind of bodies actually are needed for morphological computation and also what kind of computation we can outsource to the body itself. So let's start with that. So we asked the question, the morphology, what kind of bodies are really important and how and what is poss possible? So what are the limitations of that when we think about theoretical models? In order to do that, we have to define what morphology is and also what computation is. So let's start with morphology. Now, I think based on examples that I gave you, it's quite obvious we talk about the form, the shape, the geometric assembly of a robot. But also the second point is very crucial. We also have to consider all the physical properties that describe dynamic properties of the body. There could be mechanical things like spring constants, damping, friction, but also like chemical gradients, electrical charges, and so on. And the third component, which is very crucial here as well, is we have to consider the environment. A robot is always embedded in a bigger kind of system and it has to interact physically with the environment and it needs to be part of the morphology as well. Now, what about computation? Now, when we think about theoretical models, I'm pretty sure the first model that pops up into your mind is a Turing machine, which is an incredible, powerful, and well-defined concept. However, it's not very biological, which is not a problem for a Turing machine. But since we are talking about bi-inspired kind of concepts, we have to think about what kind of computation happens actually in a real biological system and therefore in bio-inspired robots. Well, since it's not very biological, we are not gonna wait like a door machine after a certain amount of finite steps until the computation is done. Rather, we have to deal with computation which is more analog, which is continuous, never ending, and has this kind of feedback loop through the environment. Now, this leads to the question, what kind of mathematical descriptions should we use for these kind of models? And we chose mathematical operators. Just as a reminder, what are mathematical operators? They are objects that map input functions, so a set of functions or just one function onto an output function. So not just a value onto another value, which would be a function itself, but it's more complex. Again, this sounds very abstract. Let's pull it down to what kind of functions are actually interesting for a robot. Well, for example, functions in time, sensory input streams should be mapped in a sensible way onto motor output streams. An important part is, when we talk functions of time, this means there's some memory that is needed, right? Differential equations, nonlinear controllers, for example. This means the output at a certain time step, t, not just depends on the input at this time, but on the whole history of inputs. It has to have a way of acquiring this information over time and integrating this information. And the question is, how far or how complex of a mapping can we implement with the help of a morphology? And it turns out actually we can do quite a lot. So we've shown in theory, you can implement any kind of Volterra series with mechanical systems. Now, again, Volterra series is a very abstract concept. If we convert it into something which is more adjacent to robotics, like control, right? What type of controllers can we implement with mechanical structures? Well, we can do, for example, nonlinear stable differential equations with one equilibrium point, which is quite a large class of very interesting kind of controllers. But you can push it even more. If you allow the system to feed back from the output back into the input, into the morphology itself, by having a feedback loop, what we have shown, you can also implement nonlinear limit cycles, which is great for locomotion, bifurcation, really interesting concept as well for control. And then even analog finite state switching machines. You can switch between different limit cycles, with different uh, liquid points, and even a mixture out of that. So there's almost no limitation what you can implement with help of the morphology, as long as everything is smooth and analog. 
which is actually quite not a very strong kind of problem or constraint if we talk about real physical systems anyway. Now the question is, how did we do that? And I go a little bit into details without going into equations because I think it's important to understand what kind of implication it has for the design of morphologically intelligent robots. So what we used is a machine learning technique called reservoir computing. And reservoir computing has this reservoir, which consists out of a lot of different nodes. And the nodes basically have a input, which is basically a weighted sum of all the errors that go into this node, and then one dimensional kind of differential equation, which integrates information over time. And the output is some kind of nonlinear function, like a Danzig function. And the output is then fed again through weights, which are these arrows, into other nodes again. So what we end up here is nothing else than a complex nonlinear dynamical system. And the differential equations have time constants in such a way that they are losing energy over time. So if excited, a lot of things going on, and then over time it fades out because it uh, dissipates its energy, which is actually a key component of reservoir computing. Now it's important to understand for reservoir computing to exploit this reservoir as a computational resource, you only randomly initialize it with some kind of random parameters for the time constants, for the weights between the connectivity metrics, and so on. And another important part to understand is the proper role of reservoir computing, because you apply an input signal, a time varying signal, like a sensory input stream, and you give it to a certain subset of nodes, let's say 20%. They take this on, integrate it, not only skew it and fed it into the other nodes, and they do the same over and over again. So what you end up here in this kind of reservoir is temporal integration in every single node and the nonlinear combination of the signals. But more importantly, you map this one dimensional input, for example, into a high dimensional state space of this reservoir. And this is actually in machine learning terms, a kernel, because you map in a nonlinear fashion, a single a signal into a high dimensional space in a nonlinear way, which then allows very easily to find some higher planes to classify it more easily. So it's a, it's a common trick in machine learning um, where you use kernels in order to boost computational power. Okay, and then what you need is you have to collect signals from this high dimensional state space by basically finding some linear weights, sum them up and produce a desired output. Now, as a, remember, as a reminder, basically, what we're trying to do is we want to learn nonlinear dynamical operators like a differential set of equations and nonlinear controller. And we want basically these two blue boxes doing exactly the same. So if both receive the same input, they should produce the same output. And the really interesting part in reservoir computing is the reservoir is unchanged during learning. You don't change anything in there. You just use it as a resource. The only things that you adapt during learning are these linear static output weights. And since they are linear and static, you can simply use linear regression for learning, which is really fast, right? Because if you would have to learn differential equations, you would need at least like a recurrent neural network. I mean, there's back propagation through time, for example, but it's very slow. It doesn't converge nicely. Um, it gets stuck in local minima and so on. Here, it's really fast. You always have a minimum by using this kind of reservoir. So now, where is the connection here, basically, to robotics, to our morphology? Well, if you look at the description of a reservoir, it says it has to be a complex nonlinear dynamical system. Now, this is true for the one that I've described, but people used other kind of reservoirs as well, spiking neurons, for example, physical systems as well. And actually, it turns out you can use a network of must spring temper systems uh, as a reservoir as well. And they describe pretty well biological bodies, which are soft and squishy, and therefore also they describe pretty well soft robotic systems as well. So in this case, the nodes are just mass points at different masses. And the connections are differential equations described as mass spring temper systems. And then the input, obviously, are forces. They are time varying forces, which changes the system. It wiggles around. And then you read out from all the springs their states and combine them linearly in order to produce some kind of computation. Now, there are very important kind of understanding that is important to get to the next couple of slides. 
So what we're doing is the same as before, right? We want to learn the same input to output mapping. So it's a supervised learning setup. So the first row is basically, that's the behavior that we want to emulate. So we know what the input is and the corresponding output. And then we only basically change the readout. And this can be done by linear regression. Again, we want to learn a nonlinear dynamical system, which means there's memory, there's nonlinearity in there, but we can reduce it to a simple problem like linear regression because we have the help of the morphology. Basically, we outsource all the computation into the body, into the soft body of uh, a robot, for example, or some other kind of physical system. And that's the power of reservoir computing here. But more importantly is also, there's a really interesting implication. Now, in our simulations and theoretical models and coming from reservoir computing, the reservoir itself, the body itself is randomly initialized. So it's not optimized for any kind of computation. It's just exploited for computation. Now, what we know is also going from the left side to the right side. If we do a good job in emulating a dynamical system somewhere, between these two boxes, there has to be happen nonlinear combination of signals and temporal integration. Now we know the readouts, the red arrows, they're static and linear. So there cannot be any nonlinearity. There's no memory in there. So this has to happen in the body. Now we can ask the question the other way around. Now, what does this mean? If I want to have a morphological computationally powerful body, what kind of properties are useful? Well, we need, first of all, this kernel property. So we need a high dimensional state space because you want to blow up your signals into the space so you can actually use it with the linear readout at the end. Secondly, you need nonlinear dynamics in there, right? Because you want to em emulate a nonlinear dynamical system and the readout doesn't provide that. And finally, you need a compliance system because you need this temporary integration, which again doesn't happen in the output, but has to happen in the body. Now, looking at this wish list of properties of robot bodies, now, this is something that we don't want to have usually in a classical conventional robot. Every single point of those is suppressed in a classical design, in a robot arm, in an ASIMA robot. You don't want high dimension nonlinearity and compliance because they make it really hard to model the system and therefore really hard to control. But at the same time, the wish list here pretty nicely describes biological systems and soft robotic systems. So soft, squishy kind of bodies are actually really, really good in implementing functionality that is computational. So if you want to outsource functionality into the body, you need a complex body. A simple, rigid robot arm is not doing a lot for you. And this is really interesting as well, because when you can outsource functionality into the body, the actual problem for the brain, for the controller is simpler because part of this problem is already solved in the body itself. So you don't need to model it, you just need to exploit it. And that's why I was working in the field of soft robotics because there's a clear connection. Intelligent bodies need to be soft and nonlinear and interesting in their dynamics. Now this, obviously we did a lot of kind of simulations and I will show you just uh, two examples from simulations and a real world example as well. So how do we do that now? Okay, assuming that's a limit cycle, a different set of equations that we want to learn with the help of a morphological structure. So we have this kind of setup. So we have this randomly initialized kind of mass spring temper systems. There's no input actually necessary because we have this feedback loop which sustains the energy. And what we want to learn is two sets of output weights. One should combine all the spring signals in order to produce x1, which is one of the state variables. And the other set should produce x2. And then these signals that are produced are fed back at every time step as forces into randomly chosen input nodes, which receive this kind of feedback. Now, just looking at the signals, so that's x1 and x2. It's clearly a nonlinear kind of pattern. And on the right side, you can see as a phase portray, you can see this nonlinear limit cycle. You might now ask how big of a network do you need actually to emulate such a set of equations? Well, actually, they're not that big. So that's an abstract representation of one of those networks. And actually, at this size, you can randomly produce them without fine tuning, and almost all of them are producing really, really good results. You can make them smaller, but then it's harder to find good networks.
So here, the round parts are basically masses. They have all different kind of weights. Then the red ones are globally fixed points, so it doesn't float around. And the diamonds are the randomly chosen nodes that receive X1, which is a time varying signal, as a time varying force. And the stars um, receive the time varying X2 as a feedback. And this is what we get. So X1 versus X2, the face portrait, the red one is the target. The dashed dot uh, line is what the actual output is reproducing after learning. But just remember the setup was like this, right? We didn't change anything in the morphological structure. But for learning, we have to open up the feedback loop. We provide the perfect target as a feedback, drive the system with this kind of time varying signals. And then we get a whole set of large metrics of all the data points. And then we lose linear regression. So inverting the metrics and multiplying it basically with the target. And then we get a set of output weights. The problem is if you would then close the loop, that would not be enough because even small numerical imprecisions in your implementation would lead it away from this trajectory because there's this feedback loop going on in integration. So what we need to do during learning, we have to superimpose noise. Again, really interesting. In real systems, you don't want noise or as little as possible. Here, you need noise. So you're not just learning the trajectory, but rather a region of attraction around it. And what you can see, these points are basically the data points that we provided the system with not just the ones on the trajectory. And then you get, when you close the loop, a stable limit cycle and it can push it away and it comes back and so on. Now we can take it one step further. Now we can say, now we provide an input and we want to produce different limit cycles depending on the input, like different gates. So if this little red epsilon and based on the epsilon, this kind of equations give you different set of uh, uh, limit cycles. So the blue one, the green one, and the orange one. So the setup is like this. So we have randomly chosen input nodes, like 20%. We squeeze them with a constant force at either 5, 1, or 0 0.2. And then we learn, we combine all the data, and we have one single set of output weights for all three. So it's the same set for all three. And then what we're trying to do is we just change the input and this should be enough. The system should switch from the blue one to the green one to the orange one, depending on how hard I squeeze it. And that's exactly what happens. So when we're in the state where epsilon equals five, we stay robustly there because we use noise over the time. And then after 60 seconds, we subtly switch in one time step to the next from epsilon five to one. And then the whole system wiggles around quite a lot, but then it's pulled in by this new attractor space. And you can see the color coding when it gets more the reddish brownish over time, it finds its limit cycle, which corresponds to the green one where epsilon equals one. And then we switch again, again, some kind of transition, quite a wild one, but then it gets pulled in and finds the new kind of limit cycle, which corresponds to this corresponding input. Again, we don't change the weights for these transitions. We didn't learn any kind of transitions. It's this kind of self-stabilization that we have in our uh, mass spring temper systems. Now, I would like to have a second look at what we just did, because I think it's so important and, and, and cool what we did here. So remember, we have one set of output weights. We produce some kind of limit cycle right? by pressing some points. It could be we're squeezing our robot and it produces a certain limit cycle. And then we squeeze it harder and it produces a different limit cycle. And yet again, harder, it produces yet another limit cycle without ever changing the readout there because we've learned it in all different directions. Now, you could imagine you put that as a robot dog body, right? It has some kind of locomotion. Maybe the signals that are producing are actually useful for a control signal for a knee joint. And then suddenly you put a heavy weight on it. Then you would have to change the gate, right? When we, we have a rucksack, we change our gate, we change our knees are bending a little bit more. So you need a slightly different kind of trajectory. Now the body is able to sense it through the body <clears throat> and then change the corresponding uh, signal that is produced without ever changing the readout. So the sensing in the body is implicitly learned here as well. And now we can take it even a step further, right? We can also see this green box as part of a sensor. Maybe the morphology is actually 
translating this signal into something useful. It could be a filter that is implemented in the morphological structures. And nature, for example, is using a lot of morphology to do that, to, to reduce noise, to hone into certain domains of frequencies and so on. You can also use, instead of chemical systems, you remember it's a dynamical system that we're talking about. You have chemistry in there, gradients, a change of gradient changes the state. You can read out it somehow. You can use it as a sensor. It can, can be a glove, right? If you interact with the glove, you change the morphology, which changes the state, which then can be used to do some computation. You can have intelligent furniture, intelligent architecture, anything basically that is interacting physically with the environment by using this kind of concept. Okay, so let me go now to a real world example. We did quite a lot of those, but I think this is a really interesting one. Well, we used a tentacle like this one. So it's a silicon tentacle, completely passive. Uh, this is from the Octopus project. And we submerge it into water because that's a natural environment because it doesn't do a lot of interesting stuff outside because the density is really good and optimal for the water. And then we have 10 bending sensors, five on each side, which are locally measuring basically how much it's bending there. And then it was connected to a motor, which was our input to our system, which could move back and forward. And this could be our input. And then reading through the bending sensors, that could be our output. And we use this kind of setup to do all kinds of computation. So if an input signal, the readout, and then we learn basically linear weights to combine all the signals to produce some kind of computation that we wanted. But I think the most interesting one was where we used actually a feedback loop. So in this case, again, it's the same reservoir computing setup, but now with the real physical system. So the green part, this is our reservoir now. Again, not optimized. It's just exploited as a computational power. There are interesting nonlinear dynamics, right? High dimensional system as well. It's not easy to model, but we don't need it. We just exploit it as a resource. And then we have this kind of 10 sensor weights that we we'll learn with linear regression to combine it to produce a signal. Now, which signal? Well, the signal was produced for the controller of the robot arm itself. So it was moving, time step it was measuring, producing the next time step. Basically, we used the body of the tentacle to control the tentacle through the motor. So we are basically having a loop there uh, all together doing the computation to control itself. And again, it's important to understand, we just exploit the body. We did not optimize it for that. And everything that is nonlinear and also about memory in the system, which is needed for the control is not in the readout. It's here but also in the water, the nonlinear interaction in the water is part of that. Nonlinear sensors is part of that. Nonlinear effects in the motor is part of that. Actually, everything should be green here because the environment is part of that. If you take it out of the water, it doesn't work anymore. And finally, we were able to produce a robust limit cycle. No noise was added because there was noise in the system already. And then you get a video like this one, where it moves around quite nicely. But before I start the video, after that, you can interact with it. It's safe, right? It's soft. Now you change the state of the body and then you get emergent behavior, which was not programmed in the system at all. So let's see what happens. So sometimes it tries to stop. Sometimes it tries to wriggle itself free. Again, this was not part of the, the, the learning process. These are emerging properties because we're interacting by changing the state of the system. And with the same weights, it produces a different kind of behavior. Okay, so coming back to the bigger picture, uh, I hope I was able to show a little bit without going too deeply into the theory that actually there's very little limitations of what we can do with respect to computation. The question is now, what should we do, right? Because digital computation is really good, really fast. So it doesn't make sense to implement anything in the body, but we have to think about what is the body actually for? And I think, when we look at this picture, the body is this interface, right? Where we need a physical interaction, grasping, locomotion, sensing. That's exactly what the body is useful. Now, I also mentioned these two boxes of, of questions that we ask. Let's have a look at first of how to improve the interaction. Now, I'm not going to go into locomotion. We do work on that. I want to show you a couple of examples in sensing. So this is by some work that has been done by you and Chat. 
And he looked into large scale sensing. Now it's a small prototype to start out with, but it's a, basically a silicon and these blue channels are filled with uh, water, salt water and some coloring in there. And then around you have electrodes. And the idea is you can basically measure impedance between different pairs of electrodes. And when you interact with the soft skin, you basically change the impedance. And depending on where you press down, you change different challenges in a different way, in a nonlinear way, because the morphology is very nonlinear interacting with that. So this means you can take all this data and now you can use linear regression, but that's not enough. Actually, you need a little bit more of machine learning because not everything is outsourced into the morphology, but still part of that is already done in, in, your, in the sensory skin. So it uses random forest or some artificial neural networks. And he's then able to learn from the measurements to learn back into understanding where it has been touched, has it been stretched, how much is rotated and so on. And currently Miranda is working on expanding this one and putting it in the inline of a prosthetics to understand where the pressure points are and actually improve it to make it uh, more comfortable for the user. So she moved all the sensing to one side and blow it up uh, and have also different structures in there as well. And in order to get data, she moves around with a robot arm and does a lot of work to get a lot of data to feed in into the machine learning kind of technique. technique. Okay, we also extended um, this kind of thinking of sensors in a bigger project where we worked together with Oxford, where we used it, where we looked at spider webs, which have really, really interesting kind of morphological structures. And I'm happy to talk about that more in the QA if you're interested in that. But what we did is, so Oxford was looking at the spiders and the vibrations and what kind of combination goes on. What we did in Bristol is we actually 3D printed simplified versions trying to understand which part is important for different kind of computations. So with different kind of um, spider webs. And we're able to show there's a lot of nonlinear computation that goes on and it can be used very well as a reservoir as well. And we use it, for example, as a pressure sensor. And again, if one of the spiral breaks, if one of the kind of threads are going off or breaks, it's very robust, surprisingly robust as well, which is really interesting for real world applications as well. Now, coming back to the big picture, let's have a look on the on the right side. What about control? Like if you want to control a system, what can we do? Well, we can build morphologies where we can outsource literally a controller into the body. Or we can say, well, we still provide some kind of control, but very simple. And the body is translating the simple signal into a complex behavior. And this is one of these examples. This is a jellyfish. Uh, inspired robot done by Valentino Logaccio. And the input is very simple. The stick moves up and down. Very, very stupid, actually. And then you have the morphology, which is inspired by the fin ray effect. So there's this cartilage structure that you have in the back of a, of a fish tail. And this translates this kind of movement into a very beautiful swimming movement. And it produces vortices very nicely as well. Very simple, but complex morphology is needed to translate a simple signal into complex behavior. Now you can push that. You can say, well, I use the same control signal, but I want to have different morphologies. We did that as well. So this is with an octopus robot, which had four of these tentacles, four crank slider mechanisms, and it was moving around. It was bio-inspired, but the morphology was not really well done. So what we wanted to find is a clever morphology without changing the very, very simple controller. So we wanted to have kind of morphology induced behavior. And we used artificial uh, evolution, so genetic algorithms. So we build a model. So this is in 2D, but still with four legs. We had like 24 different parameters, like center of buoyancy, center of mass, stiffness, damping. Um, this little beta is very interesting. It's the angle between center of mass and buoyancy. And then we used novel research, which basically produces a large database of all different kinds of combinations of morphologies. And they all use the same simple controller, crank slider, constant velocity, translation into some kind of tentacle movement. And then we found it actually translated into different behaviors. So these are just three of these examples. The first one is running. So it uses the front and hind legs differently, but it was running on the ground. This one is swimming, no hind legs, but really strong stroking legs to swim upwards. And this T-Rex has the front ones for stabilizing and the back for hopping around. 
Another question raises, okay, looking at these different morphologies, how could we switch between those? Because that would be interesting, right? Not changing the controller, but switching the behavior by changing the morphology. Now, a very simple approach, naive approach would be, well, running, swimming, and we change all 10 different parameters that are involved. Well, in simulation, that's not a problem, but practically that's not something good. So we went back into this huge database that was produced and we were looking for pairs, pairs that were very close morphologically, maybe just different by one morphological parameter, but very far away behaviorally. And we found quite a few of those. And I just wanna show a video so you can see how it looks like. Um, just one example, if you're interested in that, we have a couple of uh, publications on that. So this one, falls down, there's some kind of transition, self-stabilizing because it's compliant. And at t equals 11, we switched the angle to going back between center of mass and points here. And now it swims upwards. We did not change the controller. And then we switch it off, it falls down, it bumbles around a little bit. Again, transition was never learned, but it's self-stabilizing because it's compliant. And if you're interested, there are uh, some other kind of examples here as well, if you go to the paper. Okay, now this is another example, but what about learning? Can we actually use the body to help us with learning as well? Now, what we did so far is we were changing the morphology, adapting morphology, right? And therefore changing the underlying functionality. So you could use it for reprogramming the functionality. The question is which parameters should be chosen, right? And which are not. You don't want to control every degree of freedom. But another interesting question is also, what about having a body that's simple and gets more complex? What about being so adaptive that we actually have growing machines? Uh, this gets very interesting because this means a growing body can help learning problems as well. So for example, this is a problem that we looked into. We wanted to have a frog robot, for example, and learn to control it. The problem is it has a lot of degrees of freedom, a lot of sensing. So the large state space that you have to explore to find a good controller it takes forever. Maybe even not really possible to find the global kind of solution. However, if you go to the other end, to the TED pole, it's very easy to build a very simple TED pole. Maybe have a silicon kind of tail, one motor. Maybe you just find the optimal amplitude and frequency, right? Very easy to find an optimal controller. And then you change slightly by adding little legs, completely passive. It changes the model a little bit, which means the control is not optimal, but the optimal solution is close by. So you can reuse the previous experience as a starting point and move over to a new optimal point. And then you change the model again by growing and then again and again. So you're changing through going through different kind of landscapes and beckoning along this optimization process. And that's exactly what we did in this case. We wanted to build real robots. It was a little bit too ambitious because it was a PhD, but we're going to come back to that. But we did it in simulation. So we used reinforcement learning going through these kind of growing stages. So the idea was to have this randomly spawned food atoms, the green points. And then with reinforcement learning, it was able to learn a policy to approach it. So it needs to reorientate itself with the tail and then moving forward. So it was able to find that. And then we had the next discrete stage, like the proclate stage. And it's really interesting because it still has the tail, but now it has legs. It was able to find basically a new policy with the legs for the orientation, but then it ducked in the legs and used the policy of the tail in order to move forward. So it was combining previous kind of experience with the new one. And then with the final frog, it still used the same kind of policy for rotating and found a new one to move forward. And the really interesting thing, when it goes through the stages and all the learning time is actually much quicker than when you try to learn a policy in a full-blown robot. And actually it's more robust as well. So there is some kind of positive effect if you go through growing stages in a robot. And these are one of the almost last slides where I would like you to think a little bit bigger, right? If you think about a squishy, soft, passive tissue with smart materials in there, however it looks like. And there's a lot of very intelligent uh, structures nowadays. And you can imagine, you can implement something where it's a local experience, it bumps into something. And there's a local morphological change, which is not controlled by a central controller. And maybe if you have an intelligent kind of structure, 
that actually can translate different type of stimuli into different kind of morphological changes. What you end up is with a system that can learn from experience and adapt. So you can have rowing machines at the end that you can throw into different kind of environments on Mars into water. They wriggle around, they learn from experience and then adapt and optimize themselves. And this is very different from a classical robot where you have one problem and you have one solution. So these machines are much, much more powerful, but you need adaptive growing bodies. You need morphological computation in there. And we started to work in this direction. So some work has been done by Matthew. He's worked with protocells, um, where he looks first at more complex simulation, but he's also using real protocells for locomotion. Really interesting work. We also got some funding this year, a little bit to start out with muscle cells that we stimulate. So we design robots through stimulation instead of actually designing and building them. Okay, this is all from my side. Um, this is just a little... Um, Reminder that we had recently a special issue on soft robotics in IEEE control system magazines. If you're interested in the control side of morphological computation, we have an article in there as well uh, that is very high level overview of a lot of different ideas, how control and morphology can come together. And this might be interesting for some of you who's doing control in soft robotics or robotics in general. And of course, Thank you to all the people who are doing actually the real work, uh, PhD students and postdocs. Um, so these are the people who are having cool ideas and carrying them out. And I'm just presenting them uh, as a group here. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking very much forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, for those of you who are on, uh, who are joining us on uh, Zoom, you could put your questions in the chat. And people in the room, feel free to raise your hands, go one by one uh, if you have questions. So with the soft, uh, the last work you were just showing with the, is there like, would you say it's like multiple, many cells in like one single body and each cell is like a node in the reservoir com computer, I guess, uh, reservoir computing? How so, does that work? Yes. Okay. So the reservoir idea is, is one way to look at morphological computation, but it cannot describe everything that we do. So it's, this is very specific and, and almost an extreme case, right? Where you have a linear readout. Um, but for example, the example that I showed with the jellyfish, I wouldn't call it reservoir computing. There's no clear readout. The, the output here is basically a behavior that is useful for the robot and the morphology is involved there. It's still morphological computation, but it's not so much connected to a theoretical model because in a theoretical model, in order to do something sensible, you have to cut it down to something very specific, well-defined, and then it works in this domain, but it's really hard to generalize. Otherwise, it gets really kind of vague, right? And then it's not really useful anymore either. Um, so what we did with Matthew's work is, um, if I might want to go back here, this one I assume you were referring to. So these are yes. protocells, uh, which um, are generated with uh, gold particles, and we shine light on them, and they have a code around there, which temperature change, they are contracting. And the idea is that we shine individual cells um, and then we get a locomotion as a whole system. So this is a little bit different, but here it's important that there is a, a translation of the light stimulation into a contraction, and then you put them together as a big uh, kind of blob, and then you shine on one light on one side and the other one not, and then you get a traveling wave, and then actually it's moving forward. So you use morphology there in order to do this translation, but it's not connected to the reservoir computing approach. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I had a question related to that. So um, it seemed to me that the reservoir computing approach would encode uh, material properties of the, the body better. And usually, so that's what you'd be leveraging to produce the diversity of behaviors. Um, is there a way to encode shape into, uh, into that sort of formulation? Yes, I mean, whatever, in whatever way you're interacting with the system, right? So 
Um, obviously, when you have a dynamical system, uh, which means you need some kind of time constants that are representing that. So you have to have your body um, made in such a way that it can interact, right? Imagine you have a very soft blob and very high frequency input. This kind of information, because it's like a, a low pass filter, basically, it, you lose all this information and energy immediately, and you cannot get anything of computation out of that. The other way, if you have a very stiff kind of like a rigid stick, and, and then you have a blob that stops on it, you don't get information to the system either, right? So they have to be aligned to each other. The same with the shape. You can have different shapes that make big changes, right? You can have, for example, if you would have this mass spring temper system and you have a buckling mechanism, right? You bump into something and then suddenly buckle. So some springs on top are more stretched than the other ones. And then you move into a completely different space in your kind of state space. And therefore you can have completely different behaviors. So therefore you can change the shape by interacting with different shapes when you grasp something and then you can classify them more easily. So the shape plays a role as well. But if you talk about memory, this is where the dynamics are more important, for example, if you have to remember things, right? right. Does it make sense to you? Yes, yes it does. I have a question. Um, thanks for the great talk. Um, something I'm wondering is the reservoir computing uh, formalism sort of reminds me of uh, like Koopman operator theory. And you have these like linear observables and you're, uh, you know, in this case, you're trying to prescribe some dynamics by understanding correctly, whereas the like Koopman operator theory perspective is sort of trying to model dynamics from a high dimensional linear system. But something I'm, my question is sort of two parts. One is, is there a connection there? And the second one is, how far can you get away from the sort of natural dynamics of the system? Uh, like in the octopus example, it seems like, uh, you know, it would be really challenging uh, to prescribe dynamics that were super rigid in some sense. Is that true? Yes. So regarding the second question, it's absolutely true. You, you, have to, you have to be in the same ballpark, let's put it this way. You don't have to fine tune it. So for example, for our kind of... Um, simulations where we have mass spring temper systems, right? So we randomly choose masses over two orders of magnitude. So they don't have to be fine tuned at all. The same for the stiffness and damping values. So they can be quite wide range, but if you're too far away, then it's an issue. Um, regarding your first question, I didn't uh, hear the term that you used. Is it comparable to the Yapanov you said or? Uh, it's a Koopman operator theory where you're trying to approximate a nonlinear system with a high dimensional linear system. Yes. Yes, that's a really good com uh, um, comparison. Um, so, what basically what the linear kind of readout is doing is combining nonlinear signals in this high dimensional space, right? Um, so, there's, but we don't have a control over the actual kind of signals that are produced. In the reservoir, so it mm -hmm. that that's where it maybe diverges a little bit. Um, so we just hope that it works. And the surprising thing in reservoir computing, the machine learning side of it, but also in the physical reservoir side where you use real physical system, it, it surprisingly works almost always. <laughs> so you have to have a, obviously if you have a bigger system, then it's more likely you find the signals. But then there are other kind of issues. But it turns out for a lot of kind of interesting kind of problems in robotics, it's not needed, right? Because uh, most dynamical systems that you want to approximate are two dimensional anyway. So you don't have to have chaotic systems and stuff like this. What reservoir computing is really good at uh, in the class of machine learning. Um, maybe one way to understand it also is to the, you want to have some kind of nonlinear independence between the signal in your reservoir because you could have, for example, also a filter bank. So you all have the same inputs and you have basically a mass spring temper system and you wiggle it around on this kind of input signal, right? And if you have all the springs, the same kind of stiffness and the same kind of damping, so basically you have the same kind of, um, uh, like the damping is basically the exponential decay, right? Um, then they would be all linearly dependent of each other. So you make combinations and you don't get new information. And then you would have a linear readout. You wouldn't be able to do anything, right? Even if artificial or network, but you need a diversity in here. And these are basically different operators that you have to combine. And these operators have to be independent. And the more complex, independent is kind of 
kernel is working, the better signals you have and more computation you can carry out, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks for the explanation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, okay, I have one last question. Sure. Um, so if you had to uh, learn and implement a controller on your soft uh, body, and we're looking at it through the lens of reservoir computing, would it be better? It, it seemed to me that it would be beneficial to have localized sensing. For example, in your octopus arm, you had a bunch of bending sensors uh, placed everywhere. Um, what other kind of sensing modalities uh, could be useful in this case? Yes. So maybe there's a the answer is twofold. So one on the theoretical side with the reservoir computing is you want to have a readout of the full state of the system, which is possibly in simulation, right? But mm -hmm. actually in a real physical system, that's not possible. So what you want to have is basically as much information about the state of the body as possible. So we were really surprised that then simple sensors are enough to do quite complex simul uh, computations with our octopus arm. And that's definitely not everything, right? There's many more information in there when you wiggle it around. Um, so what you want is you want to have sensors that provide different sensory information in the sense they're linearly independent. Again, as before, like I mentioned, right? If you have two sensors which provide the same kind of information, but just a double value of it, uh, linear regression would give them a very low weight because it doesn't provide a lot of predictability for the target signal. It, it wouldn't reduce the error. The same if you have a sensor that is noisy, complete white noise, it doesn't provide you with a lot of information and then it gets a very low weight as well. So linear regression is doing that automatically. But the interesting part, you can combine completely different sensors. We could put in here accelerometers, right? Gyroscopes, bending sensors. We could have visual sensors in the pixels and linear regression, we can throw everything at it and it will pick and choose because it's agnostic about the sensing. It's just the information. It's just a signal. It's just one row in this huge matrix. And if this row is very useful, it gets a high weight. Otherwise, it gets a low weight. So that's a really beautiful kind of uh, uh, thing that we don't really care. And it's also more biological as well, right? You have thousands of sensors. They can be really bad sensors, but you average, and then you get a really good estimation. While in real robotic systems, well, not real, but in classical robotic systems, you have one sensor here, one sensor there. If they break or just one breaks, the whole robot doesn't work anymore. <clears throat> and nature is not doing that. And reservoir computing isn't doing that either. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there a notion of morphological computation in like multi robot systems? Like if you thought of like a collective of agent of robots, could you say they have some type of morphological computation with between them? So I I am I'm somebody who wants to be as inclusive in morphological nation as possible. So I I don't wanna cut off people and say, well, no, that's not true morphological computation because there are other people working in the field as well. Um there is some aspect to that. Actually, we did some work where we physically connected individual robots. Um, so, and, and the idea was that if you have like swarm robots, right, there is some like flocking kind of rules, which are quite simple, where they try to minimize the distance from every kind of surrounding neighbor, but also they don't want to get too far away. So the ones mm -hmm. on the outside, they want to get closer and then they basically, you can describe energy equations and they are actually well, described with a uh, mesprin temper system. So we basically connected mechanically these kind of robots. Um, mm -hmm. And then we had just the outside swarms uh, equipped with sensors that were bumping into some kind of environment. They were like retracting from the environment, which then was mechanically communicated throughout the swarm, right? And they were contracting as well. And they were able to squeeze passively through kind of narrow um, corridors because of that. So if there's a morphological computation a uh, connection there then definitely it would be morphological computation um and i mean the term is very general i think a lot of people doing what i would call morphological computation but they don't and that's fine 
it's really more about understanding that if I look at an old problem that cannot be solved with a classical robotic system, can we, by looking through the lens of morphological combination, can we find new solutions that we haven't thought about? And we need new solutions for robots that are not in an assembly line, but outside in real environments where there's a lot of noise, a lot of un model uh, uncertainty in the modeling of the environment and so on. And if you can apply that for swarms, um, yeah, good for you. Um, I, I wouldn't say anything against it. That's completely fine.